Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. We open the doors of UChicago to learners everywhere. Experience the university's distinctive approach to inquiry through our online and in-person courses in the liberal arts, culture, science, society, and more. Learn with eminent instructors and extraordinary peers in small interactive classes. Spring course registration opens February 6th. Visit graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. The end. No, your podcast player isn't playing in reverse. That's just what this episode is about. Endings. I mean, everything ends. That's all, bro. Movies end. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I'm finished. Songs end. Podcasts end. Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Days end, weeks, months, eventually, even our lives, of course, will end. But these days, the end seems to encompass more than just our lives. There is a feeling, you've probably had it, I've had it, we're all familiar with it, a feeling that the end of, well, everything is near. The novel coronavirus outbreak spreading across the world. The evidence is everywhere. Burning forests in Argentina, massive floods in Bangladesh, drought in Spain. The impacts of climate change are here and they're getting worse. Ever since this war started, there's been a lot of concern about Russia's nuclear arsenal. Here at the University of Chicago, we have something called the Doomsday Clock. The Doomsday Clock is a symbolic timepiece showing how close the world is to ending. Every year, a team of scientists moves the clock to symbolize how close they believe we are to existential destruction. This year? It is now 90 seconds to midnight. That's closer than it's ever been before. So the concept of the end doesn't feel like some far off abstract idea anymore. It's something we carry around with us all the time. It's not just a, you know, a sort of passing thought. It's on people's minds and it's on people's minds because it's, it's hard to ignore. It's a cultural uh, force that uh, imposes itself on us all the time. That's Jonathan Lear. Lear is a professor in philosophy and the John U. Neff Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. He is the author of a new book, Imagining the End, which explores from many different angles how we deal with loss and make meaning through that loss. But I think one of the experiences of living through, especially the year of confinement, was a sense of it's very, very hard to see into the future. And it felt to me like a fog, and I didn't know what to do. It felt like, you know, if you try to do something like turn on the high beams, it makes it worse. You still can't see. Maybe it's all going to come to an end. Maybe things are going to get worse. If you're a longtime listener of Big Brains, you may know that we often focus on experts with new discoveries and breakthroughs. But that doesn't tell us how to think about and deal with the concept of existential threats in the present. For that, it helps to have a philosopher. What are we to uh, do with this, you know, in some sense, the self-knowledge that we're transient beings individually. We have every reason to think the uh, human race will die out at some point. The universe as we know it will go. That transience is internal. I mean, a sense of transience and what to think about it and how to live with it well or not so well. One of the most prominent ways we live with that transience is through mourning. And Lear believes that concept, mourning, may be just what we need to find our way through the fog of our current moment. Even if our imaginations are full of um, worries about that are real and real threatening um, problems, there's nevertheless a question of like, what are healthy uses of the imagination and what are unhealthy uses of the imagination? This is, I think, tied up, very much tied up with the general theme of mourning, which is what I- is it to live honestly, well, open-mindedly with the multi-faceted um, sides of, of the phenomenon of transience in human life? 
Welcome to Big Brains. On our show, we translate the biggest ideas and complex discoveries into digestible brain food. Big Brains, Little Bites. From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, I'm your host, Paul Rand. Jonathan Lear wrote, Imagining the End, During the COVID-19 pandemic, a period when mourning was at the forefront of all of our minds. Partly it's, you can be thinking about mourning, you can be thinking about death, you know, at any time of your life, but the very words come to have different meanings over time and through experience. And I think I was reading about mourning when I was a young man. And, you know, when you read about mourning as a young man, you don't think you're missing anything or there's something you don't understand. Right, um, right. And then, you know, later you feel there's just so much you didn't understand that you get through the experiences of loss, but you would put it in pretty much the same words. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a fact fascinating part about, you know, about uh, human life and about philosophy too, that the the same words can be used at, at very, very different levels. And I think part of, I think, good writing is an attempt to uh, help people along and not just stay with cliches of, for instance, in this case, mourning. Okay. Well, I wonder if we can just start off with when you say mourning, what is it that you mean? Starting off, I mean the very thing we all mean by mourning, the paradigm case of losing a loved one hmm. through death and being at the grave. I mean, instead of just sort of moving on to some new attachment, our imaginations get busy. We begin to think, who was this person? What was our relationship really about? Where shall I go from here? And that, I think, goes to the heart of our humanity, which is we are meaning-making creatures. Mm. We really do spend time trying to think, what is this all about? Right. And this links up when I talk about the end, you know, imagining the end. I use a, the end in two ways. I mean, it's a play on the word end. One is the end of life in, in the sense of death, but also there's the end of life in the sense of end of purpose, what it's all about. And that these two come together in mourning. But we don't always use mourning as a moment for reimagining or making meaning. In fact, sometimes we just try to ignore it, even if it's to our detriment. I ran the Neubauer Collegium for eight years of the director of the Neubauer Collegium, as you know, and we had lots of conferences and I attended a lot of them. And there was one on climate change and the Anthropocene. It was a very serious conference, very fascinating. And at one point at the end of someone's lecture, a, a member of the audience got up and just said, let me tell you something, we will not be missed. What interested me was, it took me, I don't know, by surprise, but I noticed it, was that everybody laughed. And so it wasn't so much the comment, we will not be missed, but the fact that everybody experienced it is funny. I think that we're all familiar with this kind of joke is balm against the sting of a dark reality. The planet isn't going anywhere. We are. The planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas. A surface nuisance. In the moment you find it funny, you have to not be thinking about the terrible loss it would involve if um, the human race were just obliterated. You have to be sort of not paying attention to all the generous things people have done and kind things and beautiful things and brilliant things. And, right, right. you know, we're greedy, we're avaricious, but that isn't the whole truth about us. And so what happens to the, you know, I'm just interested in what happens to the human mind where all the beauty goes out of out of our minds, mm. sort of in order that we can enjoy the idea of justice done. You know, it's a fantasy of justice done. And then somehow, in some weird way, we're on the right side of justice. I mean, we're the, we're the people who can enjoy um, the fact that we're getting rid of ourselves. <laughs> and, and also, in fantasy, escape the tension. Right. I mean, I, one of the things in the book I talked about, uh, just as a, a vignette, is the, the image of the Sunday sermon where the preacher is saying, you know, we're all sinners. And imagining um, somebody in the audience or in the, you know, the pews say, well, Reverend, I mean, even you? (laughs) And, you know, if the Reverend is put on the spot with a question, even you, he'll say, yes, you know, me most of all, I'm a sinner too. 
But, you know, in that moment when he's not put on the spot, you know, when he, he's sort of enjoying the position of judging us as sinners and is sort of separating him or herself. And that's what I think that part of the dynamic of the joke is when we can say, well, we will not be this. Somehow there's a kind of stealthy eye that gets to escape the death sentence and yes. sort of enjoy the justice of it from some remove. It can be a kind of um, stance in life. I think anyone who has been on Twitter is familiar with this stance, as Lear writes in the book, quote, In the name of drawing attention to the problems we face, there is a form of discourse that discourages creativity and hope in addressing them. Despair thrives when it is not fully conscious of what it is. It portrays itself as truthfulness as the courage to face the grim reality straight on, without the wishful illusions that keep us so complacent. As you know, Paul, I trained as in, in philosophy, but I also trained as a psychoanalyst. You know, one of the things I've learned over the years of seeing patients is that a lot of times you can listen to people telling their stories about what has happened to them and what's what has gone wrong, and, and the stories are true, and they're accurate. The problems of the past were real. But there's a further question that, like, what imaginative use are you putting that story to? Why is it being told here and now in this in this particular way? And so why, why mourning comes across as healthy is that it is a kind of emotionally rich and imaginatively rich acknowledging of our finite vulnerability, hmm. and in particular vulnerability to loss. And refusal to mourn is a stance of, you know, I'm not going to let anybody matter to me enough so that should they go out of my life, I'll just move on. Now, when you talk about this, when you talk about mourning, it's you, you talk about it, though, in, in missing of a human. And I wonder if mourning in, in your mind goes beyond just a human loss. I mean, one of the things we can lose and mourn our, our ideals. It doesn't just have to be people yep. who we lose. We can, you know, fall in love with an ideal of um, some way of, 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 li of life and then, and, and then feel that it itself is threatened. You know, Freud wrote this essay called On Transience. And with Freud, I think the case, you know, the case he was dealing with, with himself was in trying to come to grips with um, the fact that we're all going to, each of us is going to die. We know, you know, it's up to some level, we're aware we're going to die. Uh, how do you deal with that? And the, one of the ways Freud dealt with it was with a sort of fantasy of this great progress of civilization. And even though he would die, the great values of scientific discovery would continue and he would have made his contribution mm. and he would be on the sort of path of progress of rationalism and uh, peaceful coexistence forever. And we were on, we were on a, a, a long march, but a steady path uh, in which he could play his role. In other words, if you connect yourself to the unending progress or ideals of civilization, you can in some sense connect yourself to eternity. But- the World War I for him shook him up in the sense that it no longer seemed like Europe was on a steady path towards more civilization. All that came into terrible question. And that, you know, that causes psychic damage and psychic threats. If your personal pride is bound up with the achievements of civilization, if it in some way falls, you lose not only those ideals, but a piece of yourself. Because if you inside have really lived sort of loving the idea of like, I'll make my place by making a contribution to civilization, and then you feel all of civilization isn't the way you thought it is, or it's not going the way you thought it is. And that's going to be devastating. Yeah, it's devastating. It's not just that you will, you know, not be eternal. Even the ideals you care about are very fragile and, and, and vulnerable. That's hard to deal with. And in some sense, we may have experienced something like this during the pandemic. And I think that does come back now in the, you know, the time of the pandemic, the time of, you know, where are the wars leading us? Which are the things that really matter in the sense of ideals of human flourishing and what matters in the universe? Two things that are crucial here. One is the thought 
a kind of historical thought. The very concepts with which we think are themselves subject to historical forces. And so there's every reason for us to think that, for instance, the concepts of human success, let's say, have been very much shaped by the historical time in which we live. If we are living in historical conditions of injustice, suppose we can see injustice around us, there's reason to think our very ideas of the good or success or flourishing may themselves be tainted with an injustice we can't really see. And one of the, so one of the things I've come up with, I mean, I went back to Aristotle and he thought, so this is the second part of the, the point, he thought part of what made us very special is that we were responsive to something that in English it's translated as the, the fine, the noble, or the beautiful. It's, the Greek word is called ta kalan. The way I might put it in, in a modern context is to say, you know, part of what makes us flourish or happy or content with life is feeling we're doing something worthwhile, that we're in the midst of a meaningful life, that it matters and there's something special about it. The kalan is this idea of, you know, there's something about the happy life that sort of shines forth and grabs our attention as being something special and meaningful. And we may need to figure out what that means over time. It's not that uh, it, it sort of registers that we may not fully know what we're talking about, but that we're getting at something important. Hmm. And how do you get at something important where you're sort of not finished thinking about what that importance really is? And I think that fits with human life. You know, we all want a meaningful life, but we don't know what it is. You know, there's something elusive about it. And, yes. we, you know, we grasp onto this or that thing and we try to think, well, this will do it. But um, exactly what it is is left, you know, it's just in the midst of our own life that there's something unfinished and enigma enigmatic about it. One way could be through mourning. When we are making serious meaning imaginatively of what things mean in the world, why they matter, why they should matter, why th why some things don't matter and shouldn't matter. That's what we do as humans. And we can really flourish in the meaning making business. <laughs> right. That's, you know, we are meaning makers when we're at our best. Yep. And mourning is one real paradigm of human meaning making. One of the forms of meaning that Lear believes may be the most important, and perhaps is an antidote to many of our ills, is through gratitude. That's after the break. Big Brains is supported by the University of Chicago Graham School. We open the doors of UChicago to learners everywhere. Experience the university's distinctive approach to inquiry through our online and in-person courses in the liberal arts, culture, science, society, and more. Learn with eminent instructors and extraordinary peers in small interactive classes. Spring course registration opens February 6th. Visit graham.uchicago.edu slash bigbrains. If you're getting a lot out of the important research that's shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is, and more often isn't, working today. From the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, Capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Well, interestingly, with all of these discussions, the, the word of gratitude comes up into this as, as you start ending the book. After all of this discussion about mourning, you don't, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of, of tying in gratitude really plays a prominent role here. Yeah. I mean, gratitude is very fascinating because on the one hand, the expression of gratitude is gratifying for those who are, you know, both to the person who expresses the gratitude and also to the people who recognize that, you know, their act of love has been recognized. But what it is, is a recognition of the freedom of this exchange, that there isn't a kind of, um, you might say, normal economy of, you know, 
you give me a gift and then I'll give you one back. You know, you invite me to dinner and I bring a bottle of wine. That the normal economy of um, gift and reciprocation has been transcended. In this way, Lear says that feeling gratitude is really a gift given twice. Not only do we enjoy the gift itself, but also the lack of need to reciprocate. When you start to think about it, there is almost no other human relationship with those parameters. You're genuinely entering the realm of freedom, recognizing it's this, this act of love or this gift or this uh, thing has been given to you with no strings attached, just absolutely free. And gratitude is the recognition of that freedom and the preservation of it in memory and in living. As he writes in the book, quote, it is an openness to being a beneficiary via activities of imagination and memory, receptiveness and acknowledgement. And to return to the beginning, this is a form of mourning attacked by those who say of the human endeavor in general, we will not be missed. Part of what I'm interested in is gratitude is a form of um, looking back, you might say, in gratitude to what has happened to me. Um, so it's a form of keeping the past alive in memory. It is, it's got the same kind of imaginative structure as, uh, as mourning. But it's the way, it's the way of preserving uh, in memory and imagination you might say the upside, it's, this is the opposite of loss, which is the mourning. This is the upside of preserving this, this happened, which was, um, you know, maybe it's over now, maybe there is a loss, but something um, very special happened in the realm of freedom and, um, and, and love. Well, well it, it, as you went toward the, the uh, wrap-up talk about the book, you also kind of got into this idea of almost defending the humanities a bit. Uh, and one of the ways um, you did it is by talking about a story with about Meghan Merkel, which is certainly, as we talk about this, is certainly in the news uh, with, with the book that's out. And I, and I wonder if you can walk us through that story and how you came to the defense of the humanities in telling that. Well, I was listening to the Oprah interview. Mm -hmm. In the interview, Meghan uh, Markle says that she didn't actually get married on the public occasion where, you know, the whole world was celebrating the marriage, that actually she and Harry were married three days previously in a private ceremony in their back garden with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Three days before our wedding, we got married. Ah. No one knows that, but we called the Archbishop and we just said, look, this thing, this spectacle is for the world but we want our union between us. Now, I'm a philosopher, so I sat up immediately when I heard that yep, because, yep. I mean, nobody can get married if you don't if you don't think that's what you're doing. I mean, if you just sort of write your name down on what you think is a scrap piece of paper, but it turns out, you know, it's an invisible ink and it comes up and it's a contract, you haven't signed the contract. You have to, you know, have some minimal understanding that you're signing a contract. Yep. And ditto with getting married, you know, you have to be in your right mind to be married. And that means you, you know, you may not want to be married married you may be ambivalent about it you may wish you were somewhere else but you you understand you're you're getting married and that's part of the wedding ceremony so once i heard according to her the wedding occurred um, a few days earlier it became very unclear to me when or even if they got married because the next day in the paper the archbishop of canterbury said well he wasn't marrying them those three days ago he married them on the public occasion now on the public occasion how could they have gotten married if both of them thought they couldn't get married because they were already married. That's what, you know, that's what philosophers do, but it's actually quite, you know, it's quite important. So like the vows that we have framed in our room are just the two of us in our backyard with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And, oh, and that was the piece that- Just the three of us. Just the, just the three of us. Just the three of us. And now the question comes, you know, okay, you know, how do you think about the reality of marriage. Now we're, now we're in the land of concepts, which is what philosophers think about, which is, you know, what, what is it to be married or to get married? What is a marriage such that this one is and the other one is just a phony or a fake? And now this is where I think the humanities comes in. I think one of the huge benefits of the humanities when it's being done well is that it gives a, an individual student or learner um, the ability to range over space and time, thousands of years and all over the world in all sorts of directions, uh, trying to uh, find out what have human beings thought throughout 
their lives of self-conscious recording what you know what matters what is it to get married or what isn't it to get married what you know what are the important cons what is happiness what is it for us to flourish you know thousands of years of thinking this all over the globe that provides a form of freedom to um experiment i don't think you know megan had it you know she knew she knew that the publication wasn't adequate to her understanding of marriage but the humanities would would give so much richness into like opening up the question of like well what what should a marriage be and that all i want to say and this is part of the argument of the book i think the humanities itself is a form of mourning <laughs> because um it is the attempt to keep alive in imagination what has already been contributed and but for the work of humanists would be lost it would be completely gone yes i mean the only reason i can you know i have the privilege of studying aristotle i'm not pushing him above others but it's just my life um the only reason i've been able to study Aristotle is that thousands of years the people have been trying to keep Aristotle's thought alive right right to study reproduction of the manuscripts um if it weren't for this sort of communal activity of mourning it would be gone all the thought would be gone and so the 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 the, the book is really an attempt to sort of explain the meaning of the, this is very different from social science or you know social science research which is incredibly important it's very different than scientific research it's a different habit of mind And so it's not I don't think it's just another form of research on a different topic it's a different manner of being and it's the form of mourning and I think the humanities are a form of mourning. Well, we'll be mourning the end of this podcast, but just as Lear says, that mourning is an opportunity to reflect on where we found meaning over the last 30 minutes and where we realize what truly matters to us. Maybe if we spent more time in mourning, we could make our world a more meaningful place. Big Brains is a production of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and a review. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.